Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Regardless of uh, who's in office or the elections or blah, 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 you got to realize, Lord's in control. And uh, those people that are too lazy to read their Bibles, well, don't be surprised if they're deceived. And those that dishonor the Lord especially are deceived. Among those are, for example, the Mormons. You know, they, uh, they actually teach and believe in their doctrines and covenants. I believe it was Brigham Young and uh, who wrote that I'm not sure I know a little bit I know enough about Mormon doctrine to, to know to stay away from it but uh, he teaches that Jesus is the brother of Satan so basically their savior is Satan's brother I believe that I really do of course their Jesus is not my Jesus uh, Mexico City's probably got hundreds of thousands of Jesus uh, well they Jesus but whatever and then you got the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Well, you know, the Bible records that, uh, at least my King James Bible records that Jesus created all things. So if Jesus created all the angels, how could he be Michael? He can't. But that's one of the reasons why, uh, for over 50 years, the Watchtower organization... Uh, got rid of the King James Bible that they had used for 50 years. You know, so what can I tell you? And then, of course, you've got all the other uh, groups that dishonor Christ in a lot of different ways. So what can I tell you? But this Bible study is going to be on the woman, the bride of Christ or the whore that rides the beast. So, the woman, the bride or the whore. Take your pick. Uh, nowadays, uh, everybody prefers the whore. She's easy. You know? Uh, I'm trying not to be crude here, you know. So, uh, all right, take your King James Bible and let's take a look at Revelation chapter 12. And then after that, we're going to go to Genesis, which is, you know, the beginning. Uh, the word Genesis is even composed of the word, uh, the first four letters, G-E-N-E. -E. Gene, as in D DNA, right? It has uh, generator. The word generator means, you know, create electricity, right? Uh, it has reference to creation. And uh, when a man and a woman get together, uh, don't they create a child? Well, technically God does, but, you know, something like that. All right, let's take a look at Revelation 12. I've spent a lot of time on this chapter in the past, but uh, we're looking at it from a different angle. So bear with me. Um, you know, there's going to be a day, probably real soon, when uh, these Bible studies are going to be banned totally. And I, I don't mean just on YouTube. I mean everywhere. Uh, the name of Jesus will only be allowed if used in a curse word or in reference to being a false prophet, false messiah. Now, absolutely, I do not believe that. But uh, the Noahide laws, um, you know, they're on the books. Some people told me they've been on the books since President Carter. And that was 1979. But I know for a fact that Reagan and every president since then has uh, honored the Noahide laws and signed it. 
and it's on the books in the United States. So when you've got a uh, Talmudic rabbi that's uh, interpreting what the Noahide laws mean, there's going to come a day when uh, this stuff is just plain illegal and banned and, you know, what can I tell you? And Jesus warned all this stuff. That's what kills me. You know, that's they, they take this dispensational theology stuff and, uh, you know, every time you show them a verse in the Bible, they say, well, that's for the other guys. That's not for us. Really? That's for the other guys that don't believe the Bible, huh? Really? Oh, I thought the Bible was for those of us that read it and believe it. But, hey, what do I know? I'm just some clown that, you know, read the Bible once or twice and, uh, you know, six years of Bible cemetery. I mean, seminary, Bible college, whatever. Yeah, I think I got it right the first time. Uh, and for those of you who don't know it, the only reason I went to Bible college was to learn their lies, to refute their lies. I mean, you got to know what somebody teaches to be able to prove it wrong from Scripture. I mean, that's just how it works, you know. Plus, I got tired of people throwing in my face that, well, I went to Bible college, Bob. What do you know? You didn't go to Bible college. I did. So I'm right about the pre-trib rapture, and you're wrong. Uh, okay. So, and don't get me wrong. There was actually some decent stuff um, I learned in Bible college, but not a lot. The book of Isaiah study was actually pretty good. I actually enjoyed that. Minor Prophets, eh, it was all right. And uh, Life of Paul, that was pretty good. But uh, pretty much everything else was standard whatever. All right, so with this in mind, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. And like I say, there's two women in the Bible. Uh, now, the, the bride is actually figuratively and literal. It's both. Type and a shadow, right? Verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, a woman, a woman, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. What is this in reference to? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. All right, uh, let's go to Genesis 37. You know, all, over, all the people that um, have a problem understanding the Bible, uh, when you ask them, hey, if you, have you ever read the whole Bible? And they'll usually say, no, I sure haven't. Well, duh. Genesis is the foundation. You know, what do you, you, know, you build a house and you don't have a foundation? Just throw up the walls and the roof? And then you're surprised when um, a little bit of wind comes and it collapses on you? Really? All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. And Jacob, now remember, Jacob's name was changed by the Lord to Israel, which means prince or ruler with God. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Uh... You know, you had Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Canaan was a son of Ham. Shem was the chosen seed line. Uh, Ham was not. Ham's not kosher, right? And oh, by the way, if anybody's interested, uh, send me an SD card or a USB drive, and I'll send you all the studies, and if you want to post them online or uh print them up or throw darts at it uh, it's up to you um because i know that one day this is all going to be illegal so all right 
verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Now remember, Jacob was changed name to Israel, and he had 12 sons. Uh, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And every time I read that, I think of plaid, Scottish plaid. That's what I always think of. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream. Ah, uh, here's that dreamer. And he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Uh, obeisance means to bow down. So Joseph is standing up and they're bowing down. And his brother said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? And we're not talking about uh, clouds and water from the sky. No, reign, ruling. Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? Uh, the word dominion comes where, is where they get the word domination. Same root word, right? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, ah, here's the Revelation 12 interpretation right here. Uh, remember? Um, well, I, let's read Revelation 12, 1 again. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, a woman, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. So let's go back to uh, Genesis 37, 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and, behold, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him. Now, here it is. Jacob Israel is going to interpret this dream. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So who's the son? Jacob Israel, who's the moon, his mother, who are the 12 stars? Well, in his dream, it was 11 stars. 11 stars plus Joseph is 12. So, and, uh, you know, when Joseph went into Egypt and became the, uh, I forget if he was the second or third ruler, I forget. I think he was the second ruler in the kingdom. Uh, Israel and his brethren, they all bowed down to him. You know? So, Revelation 12, 1. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Who is this woman? The woman is Israel, people. The bride of Christ. The bride. Not the whore. The bride. Now, a bride can act like a whore, all right, so Israel was to be the bride of Christ. That's just how it works. All right, let's uh, hit Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. 
What? We got to overcome? What? But Billy Graham told me, just say a sinner's prayer for 30 seconds and that's it, dude. You're saved. Um, you know, you don't have to have a change of heart, repentance. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, well, you know what? Billy, Billy Goat Graham might be wrong. I don't know. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither and I will show thee the bride. Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Ah, Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, who's the bride? Well, verse 12. And had a great, uh, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names, the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Twelve gates, twelve tribes. There is not a thirteenth Gentile gate. I'm sorry, Mr. Universalist, but there isn't. So how do they get in? Uh, you know, that's it, right? All right, so in Revelation 12, verse 1, uh, we did read, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman which I believe is Israel, figuratively, the bride of Christ, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. All right, so who was the mother of Israel? Well... That's a real simple question. Uh, it would be in Genesis 3 and verse 16. Now remember, Eve had just uh, done, uh, you know, she just met the uh, serpent, right? And the serpent told her, ah, oh, don't worry about it. You're not going to die if you disobey the Lord. But here... In verse 16, now we're going to go back to this. God said unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Hmm. Sorrow and conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Back to Revelation 12, verse 2. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Huh. Is there a... Spiritual application to this. Well, I kind of think there is. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, trouble, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. All right, so the woman, Eve, Representative of kind of a shadow of the church, right? 
being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Verse 3. We're at Revelation 12, by the way. 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, does this have a literal application? How about a spiritual application? Let's take a look. How about Genesis chapter 4? Now, we're going to go back and, you know, this is uh, the woman. You got the woman, Israel, the church, and then you've got the bride of Christ, and then you got, contrast that with the whore. I'm kind of going to do the whore first, and then we'll go back and do the bride of Christ. But, all right, Genesis chapter 4. Uh, now, remember something. God told Eve that uh, she was going to have pain in childbirth. Remember that in Genesis 3? I find it funny. Here it is. Uh, you got a snake hanging from a tree, an apple tree, and she takes a bite out of the apple tree. Well, if you listen to the demon nominational churches. And then God pronounces the curse. Oh, you're going to have pain in childbirth. Um, wait a minute. She took a bite of an apple, and she, God's going to multiply her sorrow and conception in childbirth, bring in pain, bring forth children? Why didn't he give her a toothache? Uh, yeah, ask your pastor that question, and uh, watch him do a song and a dance. Yeah. And it probably won't be tiptoe through the tulips by Tiny Tim either. So, And if you remember that, you're old. All right, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Huh. Is Adam the Lord? I don't think so. Why would she say that? And she again bare his brother Abel. So evidently, the the way these uh, this is reading, uh, they were evidently maternal twins. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. I wonder if it was a rotten fruit that was no good. That's uh, kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, this fruit ain't no good. I ain't gonna eat this stuff. It's starting to rot. Right, I'll I'll give it to the I'll give it to the Lord. All right. So Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Verse four. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. Now, there's a Bible verse, I think it's in Leviticus, where it says that the uh, firstborn uh, belongs to the Lord. And uh, funny, I'm firstborn of my father, uh, earthly father. So, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, all right, so, and Abel, he also brought of the first firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Where do I see that? Let me see if I can find it real quick. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Um. Uh, you know, if you have cancer and it goes into remission, it means it, it goes away, right? Well, apply that to sin. Remission of sin, right? All right, so. 
And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain, uh, Genesis 4, 5. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Cain was mad. Oh, man, I, I got all this rotten fruit and gave it to the God, and he don't like it. What an ungrateful, yeah. I, I can imagine that's probably what was going at, in, through his mind. I don't know. You know, the Bible says not nothing, not one good thing about Cain. And nobody can show me in the Bible where one descendant of Cain ever got saved. Not one. Matter of fact, I got $100 in my pocket right now. Anybody can show me where any, either Cain or any of his descendants got saved. Yeah, show me. Oh, it has to be the King James Bible, by the way. Uh, uh, the, the Church of Satan Satanic Bible doesn't count. All right, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of, of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew him, he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Now, if people say, well, you know, Adam was Cain's father, so was Adam the wicked one? Seriously, Adam is the wicked one if you believe that Cain was fathered by Adam, then Adam has to be the wicked one. Because it says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Wouldn't that make Adam the wicked one? Well, that's what some people teach. That's what the majority teaches. But, uh, you know, I don't always go with majority report. But that's just me. All right. Back to Genesis 4, verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth. He was angry. And his countenance fell, and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance falling? fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? But he didn't want to do well, right? And if thou doest not well... Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. I find that interesting. Sin lieth at the door, and thou shalt, and unto thee shalt be his, his desire. I actually read a commentary in uh, the Jewish commentary where it said that there was a devil, a demon, named Sin, a fallen angel. I don't know how true it is, but um, Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his, his desire... I, it's, I don't know. That's some really weird stuff, huh? And thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Wow. Uh, who was the first murderer? Yeah. You know, there's two lines in this earth. Two lines. There's the uh, the bride of Christ, and then there's the uh, the whore. All right, let's go to John eight real quick. Uh, Jesus, let's see where are we going to start here.
Well, Jesus is talking to a certain group of people. And no, he's not talking to the Romans. So I guess we'll start in verse... I guess verse 40, John 8, verse 40. But now ye seek to kill me. Oh yeah, wasn't the Romans. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Oh boy, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even so, verse 43, Why do ye not, un why do ye not understand my speech? even because ye cannot hear my word. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Who was the murderer from the beginning? Well, we just read Cain. So why would Jesus say you're, you're of your father the devil? And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Who told the first lie? In the Garden of Eden. Well, okay, I take this, I take that back. The first lie, I believe, was when Satan tried to get the angels to follow him and to kill the Lord. And I believe, well, this is my opinion, and if you disagree, that's okay, because, you know, there's some things the Bible's uh, kind of quiet about. But I believe that the war in heaven in Revelation happened in the past. Somewhere between Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. That's my opinion. Other people say, well, it'll happen in the future. That's all right. You know. But I think that was the first lie Satan had probably ever told. Was to get the angels to follow him. I could be wrong. I don't know. But the first lie he ever told, uh, recorded in the Bible, was when he told Eve, ye shall not surely die. You know? The tree of good and, good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Wow. That's some heavy duty stuff. All right, let's go to Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, now this is Jesus speaking, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Who was the good seed? Adam and Eve, right? But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, tares, weeds, and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Uh, sowed wheat, huh? Hmm. 
Didn't Jesus say he was the bread of life? What's bread made out of? Well, you can make bread out of millet, and you can make bread out of rye, but in the West, generally, we eat wheat bread. We eat wheat bread. You know, if you were from a foreign country and you didn't know what wheat was, I mean, how do you spell wheat? W-H-E-A-T. Eat. You eat wheat. E-A-T. Uh, that's what they call embedding. Uh, you look at the word meat. M-E-A-T. Oh, what do you do? You eat meat. Uh, sometimes in the Bible, uh, they'll say they sat down for meat. I mean, you could it it just meant having dinner, uh, not necessarily having a steak or whatever. Of course, nowadays common usage for meat is uh, animal protein, but in the times past, it just meant to have dinner. I mean, it could could have been a vegetarian meal for you know. Vegetarian. Uh, it's an old Indian word. It means lousy hunter. Yeah, vegetarian. Matter of fact, uh, vegetarianism is a doctrine of devils. If you're now, if you're doing it for health reasons because they poisoned all the meat with uh, antibiotics and steroids, I, I can understand that. That's not a doctrine of devil. But if you're doing it because uh, you want to be a, an Essene, E-S-S-E-N-E, -E, I think it's spelled, which there's a bunch of you-know-whos running around saying, well, you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then you had the Essenes. And then they'll tell you, oh, Jesus was an Essene. Uh, where's that in the Bible? I can't find it anywhere. Yeah. I've read that junk, but uh, they'll say, well, you know, the Essenes were a bunch of vegetarians. Where's that in the Bible? I'll give you a hundred bucks if you can find it in the Bible for me. Uh, I won't need to open my wallet because it ain't in there. It ain't in there. All right, so verse 25, but my, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Now, fruit sometimes refers to something that grows from trees. Sometimes it refers to children, right? Verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, Didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares. Gather ye together first the tares. And bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, somebody said, send the pre-tribbers a memo. Because this is... This explains to them why they're wrong. All right, so let's go skip to verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, 
I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret, secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. In other words, dude, we don't, I don't understand this. Can you explain this to me? I mean, you know, I'm, yeah. Verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Is Adam the son of man? Jesus created all things, right? And Jesus called himself the son of man oftentimes. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Is Adam the wicked one? Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Wow. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. That explains a lot, right? As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And then shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Huh, did you know that not everything, well, hold on a minute here. Now, who created everything? Well, in Revelation 4.11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Do you know that we were created for God's pleasure? Um, yeah, even Satan, I suppose. I mean, the Bible even records that um, Pharaoh was raised up to show forth God's power uh, during the Exodus. You know? Colossians 1.16 For by him, Christ, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Unless, of course, you're talking to the Jehovah's Witnesses and they'll say, no, no, no. You know, oh, that's not right. Because they don't know who Jesus is. Their Jesus is an angel. I don't think so. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. How about 1 John chapter, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, not 1 John, John chapter 1, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Unless, of course, you're a Jehovah's Witness, then the Word became a God. And they say they believe in one God, but God and a God is one plus one equals two. Oh, uh, okay, never mind. Yeah. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Oh, yeah. 
All right, so. All right. Uh, remember the parable of the wheat and the tares. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, right? Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees. Scribes and Pharisees are the you-know-whos. Scribes were the copyists of the law. They were the ones that wrote the, uh, the um, well, they didn't have a printing press back then to print Bibles with, so they copied it on animal skins and uh, like a paper type thing or whatever. So, you know, when you write the same thing over and over and over, you should know it by heart, right? Uh, yeah, I remember I got stopped by a cop one time and uh, I forgot my wallet. And I said, well, I know my driver's license number. He goes, who remembers their driver's license number? I go, well, you know, because back in the day, uh, when you went to the bank, you had to write your driver's license number on your paycheck. Uh, you do that every week for 20 years, and guess what? You remember. <laughs> you know? So uh, I, he looked it up, and boom, there it is on his computer. And, uh, you know, I knew my date of birth, my address. And he goes, all right, well, next time, don't leave your wallet at home. Now, yes, sir. Anything you say, officer. But uh, the scribes, they knew the letter of the law. But most of them probably didn't know the spirit of the law. There's a difference. All right. Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, is there anything wrong with eating bread, uh, you know, washing your hands? I don't know about you guys and gals, but uh, my mom always said, wash your hands before dinner. Well, I'm sure there was some kind of ritual involved, okay? Well, you know, you got to start with your right hand and you could put your left hand and start from the top and then you got to go to the bottom and then you got to do this and then you got to do that. There was probably some kind of ritual. That's not in the Bible. That's my guess. Verse 3, But he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whatsoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. In other words, uh, if he curses his mom or dad, it's a gift. Yeah, you curse your mother and your parents, and it's a gift, right? It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. I guess uh, beating your parents on the head with a hammer is a gift, right? According to the Pharisees. Verse 6. And honor not, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. So, if you cursed your parents, or struck your parents, that was a death offense in the in the Torah, in the law. But the Pharisees said, Nope, he shall be free. Jesus said, Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Yeah, they're oral traditions. They're opinions of rabbis. And where did this come from? Babylon. Verse 7, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain, you know what vain means? Worthless. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. 
Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. So you eat a piece of bread because your hands weren't washed properly? That doesn't defile you. Uh, Peter, in his vision in the book of Acts, where the sheet was let down with all the unclean beasts, uh, if a Greek that came to believe in Jesus Christ had ate pork, did that make him unclean? No. It's not what goes into the mouth, it's what comes out of the mouth. Verse 10, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Jesus, you're not very nice. You're, you're, you offended those poor people. That's not very Christian-like, Jesus. Well, that's what the, uh, that's what the uh, atheists so-called would say, right? That's, very, that's not very Christ-like. Calling them uh, children of the devil and serpents and vipers uh, like John the Baptist did, that's not very Christ-like either, is it? According to the demon nominational churches, huh? Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard the saying? But he, Jesus, but he answered and said, Listen carefully. Every plant... Think about the wheat and the tares. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. What? But we just read that, uh, you know, the Lord created all things. The Lord created all things. How can he be saying every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up? Think about that. Verse 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Oh, yeah. Do you get it? Every plant that the Heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Year of your father, the devil? Anybody? Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one? Anybody? Yeah. All right, let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. Boy, we're going to beat this to death. Verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Read Job 38 if you don't know who the stars of heaven are. They're the angels. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to deliver her child as soon as it was born. What did Cain do? Killed Abel, right? Uh, okay. Is there a... Well, that's the shadow. Is there the real deal? Where's the real deal? Oh, that's simple. I know where that is. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Boy, we're jumping all over the place. I feel like a frog, huh? No, I'm joking there. Uh... Frogs are not a good thing in the Bible. But I am jumping around like one. So, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, uh, like I say, Josephus, a Jewish historian who worked uh, for the Romans at the time of Christ, 
said that uh, Herod was of Esau Edom, the bad seed. And who am I to argue with him? Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. You know, there are wise men that still seek Jesus. Oh, yeah. Verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now there are, I've heard it, somebody, somebody told me this recently. I said, you know, maybe only the wise men could see the star because they were the only ones that paid any attention to it. I don't know. Was there a, a star that only they could see? Or I don't know. Makes you wonder, you know. All right, verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Well, Herod right now, he's got more than just his pants on fire. I'll tell you that. Verse 9. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they, had, uh, they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures... They presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Oh yeah, stay away from that Herod, he's bad egg. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Isn't that just what we read in Revelation chapter 12? About uh, verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born? Oh, yeah. All right, so Joseph has a dream. Take the kid to Egypt. Get out of Dodge. Verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Isn't that what the book of Exodus is all about? God called Israel out of Egypt. Oh yeah. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. He was mad. And sent forth and slew all the children and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem in all the coast thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of 
the wise men. Boy, I tell you what, what an evil, satanic devil Herod was. That whole family. Verse 17. Thus was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. All right, so if you want to keep reading, you know, well, all right, 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child with his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Uh, and when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in the city called Nazareth, that he might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Well, guess what? Samson was also a Nazarene. All right. Back to Revelation 12. Verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Isn't that what Herod tried to do? Yeah. Verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child. Who? Mary, right? And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Oh, yeah. So who is this that's going to rule with a rod of iron? Uh, well, there's a hint in Revelation chapter 227. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. How about Revelation chapter 19? Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thighs a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I hope you know who this is. So, keep that in mind. Back to Revelation 12, verse 5. All right, so, Revelation 12, 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Uh, isn't that what happened at the resurrection? Oh, yeah. Verse 6. And the woman, this is the bride. You know, uh, you can't argue with a pre-tribber. They'll tell you, oh, no, this is the you-know-whos, and... You know, we're up, we're, we're gone, we're, in the, we're up in heaven, pre-trib rapture, having the marriage supper of the Lamb, while everybody else on earth is getting slaughtered, because uh, God loves us too much to let us suffer for the faith. Yeah, well, that's their uh, fairy tales. No. 
And the woman, the bride of Christ, the church, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. Do you know that God's preparing a place? No, it says prepared, not preparing, prepared. The place is already done. It's ready to go. Where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's uh, basically the 42 months. And there was, past tense, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. See, I think this happened in Genesis 2. Some place between Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Um, I think it happened after day 6. I'm not sure. Because the Bible said, well, here, let me look it up. All right, in uh, Genesis 1.31... And God saw everything that he had made, everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So up to this point, I think everything was good. Satan hadn't fallen yet, and uh, yeah. And God saw everything that he had made. Behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Uh, and then in Genesis chapter 2, and then it talks of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, that's 2.17. I am of the opinion that that could possibly be Satan himself. I'm kind of leaning towards that. So somewhere in Genesis 2, uh, maybe it was during the seventh day. I don't know. Um, that's, I, that's when I think the, the fall of Satan happened. You know, because, I mean, it does say uh, in Revelation 12, 7, and there was war in heaven. Was, past tense. All right, so Genesis 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Now remember something. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. I've heard people say, oh, well, the devil and Satan are two different beings. Well, that's not what my Bible says. And what about that old serpent? Well, in Genesis 3, when the serpent was talking to Eve, who do you, what do you think they're talking about here? A snake that talks? No, it tells you right here. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. They got booted out. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast out, which accused them before our God day and night. Yeah. Uh, Satan accuses us before the Lord every time we do something bad. I must have uh, been a full-time job for him and uh, before I was 30 years old. Uh, yeah, I was probably was a full-time job. You know what that Bob Walker did? And, uh, yeah, and occasionally I, I still uh, give him uh, something to talk about, so. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb 
and by the word of their testimony. So you got to have the blood of the lamb. You got to have the word of the of testimony that you're in Christ and they loved not their lives unto death. Somebody tell that to the pre-tribbers. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time oh yeah who's this woman the bride the church um verse 13 and when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child and under the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. A time is a year, two time, uh, and times is two years and a half a time, six months. So three and a half years. Uh, and you say, well, Bob, where, where, the, where in the heck do you get that from? Oh, well, in 12.6, Revelation 12.6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared to God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's roughly 42 months. 12 months plus 24 is 36 plus, two, uh, plus 6 is 42. Hey, two years of college and I can count. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, two years of regular college not including the six of the Bible college. Yeah, not including all those months and years I wasted in technical school taking all kinds of stuff, but it was preparing me for this day. So, and the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face from the face of the serpent. All right, go to the book of Exodus 19. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. All right, so here it is. Moses had, uh, at the Lord's command, had uh, destroyed Egypt. Well, the Lord did it, but, you know, he, he used Moses as his mouthpiece. Well, him and Aaron uh, pretty much destroyed Egypt. And Israel left, and now they're in the wilderness. They've left Egypt. Remember that. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Oh, yeah. And how I bear you on eagles' wings. Isn't that what we just read in Revelation 12? The woman was uh, taken on the wings of eagles? Yeah. Um, Revelation 12, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished, for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Back to Exodus 19, verse 4. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. See, the King James Bible explains the King James Bible if you will 
let it. The modern Bibles change the words so that you don't make the connection between Exodus 19 and Revelation 12. They change the words. And then you don't think, ah, oh, God led Israel out of Egypt. Well, he did that in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, isn't God going to take Israel out of Egypt again, spiritual Egypt, and spiritual Babylon? What do you think this world is? This world is Sodom and Egypt and Babylon. You've seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if, I, F, if, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Oh yeah. A peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests, an holy nation. Now, is that in the New Testament, those kind of words? Well, uh, yeah, they are. Wow, look what I just found. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation. Oh boy, uh, those whosoever will people, we call them Arminians. That's a, one of them fancy theological terms. They hate that. They hate the idea of God having a chosen people. Unless, of course, it's the you-know-whos who deny Jesus and curse his name. Those are their chosen people. You know, an elect uh, they don't believe in election. I don't know how you can't believe in election. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. Isn't that what we just read in Exodus? Yeah. A peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah, there you go. We just read that stuff, right? We just read that in Exodus. Peculiar, chosen. Yeah. All right, well, we read that in uh, Exodus 19. How about Deuteronomy chapter 14? Deuteronomy 14. Verse 1, ye are the children of the Lord your God, ye shall not cut yourselves. Uh, I guess that's tattoos, I'm not sure. You notice uh, a lot of women like to cut their wrists, slit their wrists. I've never heard of a, a, a Christian woman doing that. It's always the, before they become Christians or the non-Christians, I guess you could say. Uh, ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. Now, that's a new one on me. I don't, I have, don't ask me because I don't know what that means. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee, Oh boy, but, 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 but I was always taught in the Free Will Baptist Church that we pick the Lord. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Huh. Wow. All right, let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. Verse 14, and the woman were given, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, 
into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. I believe that's going to be God providing manna. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. Water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Huh, what is this water? All right, let's go to Revelation 17. Jumping around like that froggy again, right? Uh, they're talking about the beast here. I guess we'll start verse 13. These, shall, uh, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. There's that chosen again. Oh boy, God has a chosen people, trust me. And it's not those that deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. All right, you got the bride and you got the whore. So let's look at the whore a little bit. Verse 15. And he said unto me, The waters, the waters, the waters, which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. What? Bob, what is you a talking about? Well, let's go to Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made, been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Ah. Verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Let's go back to Revelation 12. Verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Ah, have you ever wondered why Europe the uh, United Kingdom and the USSA are flooded with, um, yeah, peoples, nations, languages, and tongue. Well, tongues, yeah, I'm paraphrasing there. Are we being flooded? Yes, we are. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Isn't the church, the bride of Christ, being flooded? That he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Ah, but there's a there's help from the Lord coming here. Verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Oh, now, how, wait a minute, Chaplain Bob, come on now, how's the earth going to open her mouth? Oh, simple. Oh, I suppose you're going to tell me that she's got eyes and ears and a nose too, Chaplain Bob. People, you know, sometimes the church will, something that's a figure of speech, they'll say is literal, and then other things that are literal, they'll say it's a, figuratively or a figure of speech you know come on people you know all righty let's go back to genesis chapter 4 verse 8 
And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Oh, yeah, like, like the Lord is uh, asking Cain a question here. Hey, uh, I haven't seen your brother all day. You know where he's at? Yeah, right. Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Hey, Lord, it's, it's not my day to watch him. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Listen to this. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth. What? And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth, opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Ah, the earth opened her mouth to receive Abel's blood. Figure of speech, right? Verse 12, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So Cain was not ever going to be a farmer, and he was going to be a wanderer, a fugitive and a vagabond in all the earth. Can you think of a group of people that are never farmers and always wandering all over the place? Uh, yeah, I can, but I don't want to say it because I, I want to try to keep my channel on YouTube for a while. Yeah, they lost uh, six and uh, times the million, they say. Yeah. Now, in uh, Numbers chapter 16, you had some people uh, named Korah, Dathan, and Abiram who were uh, of the children, I think they were of the children of Levi, just like Moses and Aaron. And they were stirring up trouble against Moses. They were, but they weren't just disrespecting Moses. They were disrespecting God's uh, leadership. Leadership. I mean, here it is. They're they they're challenging Moses' authority, but they're not challenging Moses. They're challenging the Lord. And if you want to read uh, number 16, you can pause right here and read it. So... Uh, Let's see. Uh, number 16, 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get, uh, speak, I'm sorry, speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses ro uh, rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. See, here it is, God picked Moses to be the leader, to be his mouthpiece to the people, and these wicked, evil people are challenging the Lord by conspiring against Moses, basically. And God's getting ready to deal with them. Verse 27. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby, listen to this, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the Lord 
I'm sorry, and the earth open her mouth. Ah, but if the Lord make a new thing and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up. Ah, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up and all that appertain unto them and they go down quick into the pit. Then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them. Wow, not only did the uh, earth open up, but it closed on them. And they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, and they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out, uh, there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Wow. So, what does it mean to swallow up uh, the earth, help the woman open her mouth? Revelation 12, verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, the church, Israel, the bride. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it does to me. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, angry, mad. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's go talk about the woman. Oh, I see I'm already an hour and a half here. All right, well, let's make this a part one. I haven't even touched on Eve yet, and it's already an hour and a half. So, all right, this is part one. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.